Oh my, let's pretend a Daily Terrors novel, Chapter 1. In the end, we're all scheduled to die. The trick is to know who we are when the time comes. I was living in Deland at the time and the evening rain shower had passed leaving a humid haze in palm trees over the hotel parking lot. I was glad to be in my apartment in dry clothes again, though a warm breeze crawled through the window suffocating my skin in a tropical blanket of heavy air. Living here had felt like home. It rekindled my sense of childhood and the life I'd once had before losing my fiance, Shirley Stevenson, before the terrible tragedy she had left behind, suicide, that's what they said. My boss had questioned my move. He said I was ditching a chance he gave to rebuild my reputation after having lost my gig as a Rolling Stone reporter, and that moving from Lakeland wouldn't heal the pain. He said there's no place far enough for a man to escape his past. But I needed to leave behind all the memories of Shirley and the long two-hour commute to the paper. The way I saw it, I had nothing to prove by staying and I was killing two birds with one stone by leaving. Plus, my shrink was happy that I'd be closer to her. That damn woman had ulterior motives and I always knew that. But I was getting too close to Julia Livingston, MD extraordinaire. It was a twist of fate some say, or a stroke of odd luck to be any closer to her than I had to be. My father had once said that every man deserves his secrets and I was worried she had started to discover all of mine. And so enough time had finally passed, enough time to start forgetting. It had been two months since I'd even last seen Julia and I'd landed a freelance job reporting for the Orlando Weekly. It wasn't a step up from the Rolling Stone, but it was a new start, especially since it helped pay the hotel apartment rent. Until now, everything was getting better for me. The bills were getting paid and the stories had started coming in. I had even found some peace of mind ever since Shirley's death, ever since I put her death so far behind me, yes, so far behind me that I could start to forget. Anyway, I'd always wanted to live in the Palm Hotel, a renovated century-old hotel with apartment sublets, just a few blocks from the Athens Theatre in the heart of the Deland Historic District. I remember walking by this place as a kid, always wondering what went on behind these dusty windows and holy shit here I am now, living in the same hotel with strung-out junkies, midnight prostitutes and disabled war veterans. And now I knew what the inside of the place looked like and the air is so heavy that the smell of urine lingers in the dirty elevator, and the stripped carpets and dust-filled corridors. Always the feeling of ghosts lurking. There wasn't a hallway in the hotel where you couldn't find a cockroach. You just had to look hard enough. Undercover cops were also crawling the perimeters, I never would have guessed after all this time that I'd be living here. The last thing I remember my mother saying, you don't want to end up in a place like that, Billy, through the window glass, I saw the corner of the sidewalk where we had once stood, the two of us so long ago and I could now feel the humid October wind brush into my chest. I wanted it to clear the stuffy room, wishing the dog days of summer hadn't lingered. The air conditioner was broken, its magic replaced by a cracked window, ceiling fan, and splashes of cold water on my face. I turned on the faucet and stood at the sink seeing my reflection in the shiny steel shaving blade, not only the blade, but also in the mirror above it. My grim face seems on the edge of something dangerous, something sharp only so it can break the growth of my skin, something inside trying to break free, yes. I held a sharp and deadly blade. Singled edged. The kind the old timers use. At first I thought the blade triggered something terrible in me. But then I realized, yes, it was her, Amelia Hatchett, the woman laying naked on my bed. Call it anger or despise, but I needed to get her out of my life too. I had known her two months now, a stripper from Los Angeles with a soft titus and wide eyes that never blinked and would clicked at first, because she wanted to hear my crazy and bizarre stories about LA while I was writing for the Rolling Stone. It's a wonder we never met in the City of Angels, and it was a good thing too. The woman had brought me no calm. No calm. That's right. It wasn't the blade stirring bad emotions in me. No, it was what she said the other night, Frank Sinatra was spinning on black vinyl. The singer's voice echoed in my ears and rang like a bell to a new round in a boxing fight, why did you have to remind me, Amelia? Why did you have to remind me of the final words Shirley had said? She rose from the bed and fixed the needle, then laid back on the sheets and spread her legs open so that I would want her, 
her tight lips puffing a cigarette, but I set my eyes back to the mirror, remembering Shirley's voice as I spied a speck of blood on my chin, a tiny dot of blood that wanted to escape, as if imprisoned by my flesh, a spurt of life trying to be free from dead skin. The mirror. It never lied. My hair was mostly brown, amber eyes, a glimpse of grey in the stubble, colored dark by cold water. I wished it were darker. All brown, like it was when Shirley was still alive. Perfect, like when she still loved me, my thumb and forefinger pinched the blade. I pinched harder upon the sight of her bare skin and lips, still remembering what she had said the other night, how could I forget? Her words were like feline claws tearing open old wounds, I brought the blade up into my throat, making the grey speck of loosened hair fall into the white sink. Then I turned to face Amelia, sitting back on the bed, lying with pink heels touching her buttocks letting a flowered flap of blue satin drape over. She rubbed her nose, rolled and freed a deep puff from her raspy cocaine wrangled voice, I've been wanting to talk since the other night. Why do you have to go off the deep end get so mad, I don't know. Are you still mad at me, Billy? Is that it? I swabbed the blade in the water. Not enough blood in there to make it pink. Not enough shaving cream either, to make it milk white. Say something, she said. You've been standing there in silence, while I'm waiting here naked, ready to make it up to you, listen, you asked me to shave, that's right. She said. I hate a man's stubble, well then, don't push me. You know how I don't like to be pushed, pushed? She draped the blue lace over her breasts and tightened the satin rope around her waist. I'm not pushing you honey. Come on now, I didn't want her to come any closer. But she did, her voice was jittery. I told you I didn't mean it. I thought you forgave me. You promised, I don't want to talk about it, I'm sorry, Billy. You know I needed the money. It was Vicky's idea to make some big bucks and I thought I could get Dash. Damn you and Vicky. After everything you told me about her, you've got to go and do that. Must have been real dough, enough to powder your nose a few weeks, wasn't it? She sighed and stepped back, I had to ask. How could I not be bitter? You must believe me. You must understand. I didn't want to get angry. I only wanted peace of mind. How old were the kids? Huh, she stepped back and clenched her hair. I knew she was too confused to answer, they were teenagers for Christ's sakes, oh, Billy, she said. You've got to believe me. It's just that I couldn't resist the money, what happened the other night was business, don't you see? Sure I do. Good for you and Vicky on lowering the whore standards, wait. Please don't get mad at me. The cigarette in the ashtray looked mighty fine. I wanted another puff, so I had one. It felt better to waste another breath to a cigarette, rather than her. I saw her step closer again. Her hands reached out for my embrace, but I backed away, the music stopped just in time. Only a scratching sound filled the air. I guess it was time for her to turn over a new leaf as they say, and play the other side of the record. But she stopped at the record and reset the needle instead of turning it over, I said, it's amazing what girls will do for money, right, she said. And it's even more amazing what guys will do with it. Are you getting sarcastic with me? She reached out again to hug me. Come on, Billy. The other night was just business. Love and sex are two different things, right? Sinatra sang again. The poor dead soul's voice kept ringing like a bell in my head. How I wanted to meet a man like him, free to have it his way. Damn Amelia. I remembered the words she had said the other night, the same last words Shirley had said the night she died. Why'd she have to remind me, poor Shirley? The poor soul. Up there with Sinatra now. Doing it her way, forevermore. Come on, Billy, Amelia said wrapping her arms around my chest to trap me. The bait of her skin was cold, pale and soft. But I pinched the blade tighter, then brought it down hard, yes. I brought it down to my upper lip. This was the final cut, the last hair to fall on Amelia's face, that tiny grey speck. Yes. It finally fell on her cheek as she stared into my eyes. Let me kiss you please, the phone suddenly rang. It was just the perfect excuse to get away from her. I brought the phone to my ear, just as a new song played, the voice was military-like, familiar. 
Yes. It was Detective Jenkins, the only black detective on the police force and he always meant business. It's about time you answered the phone. Man, there's a bloody mess over here and you're missing the action. Shit, nobody's seen anything like this at the lake, well, not since Shirley's death. What do you mean, another suicide, he said. Someone saw a girl hanging from a tree limb near where Shirley was found. At the same lake. I'm on my way. Just as I hung up, Amelia let her blouse slide to the floor. Her bare breasts hung over, but I couldn't be bothered. When she came closer, I set my hand on her shoulder and pushed her away. I gotta go, are you picking me up later, what? I thought you're off, please, Billy, she said. We're a dancer short tonight. Some girl is a no-show. They called me in to cover for a few hours. My sister's giving me a ride there, but I need one back, it all depends. On what? Listen, I want to know why you said what you did the other night. And then I'll tell you, I slapped cold water on my face. It was time to let the blade slide into the water, to let it rest before the next cut. In the least, picking her up would mean she'd have packed her bags tonight and hit the road. I had to get to Indian Lake. Back to the place where Shirley was found dead, how the hell could another girl be hanging there? How could it be? 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 How could it be?